Hi guy, welcome to the 101st episode of the Amiga Rama podcast. My god, these numbers really are rolling on by. Of course, we need to do something special for this first of a long line. And I decided to go with Virgin, or is that Sega's? There's a little bit of 7up mixed in there. Cool spot. Not quite sure how this fits in with some of the great games that we've been doing lately. And I especially think so with the last few episodes. We really have some belters out there. Anyway, that's all coming up in a little while. For now, let's have a look at some of this past week's Amiga news. With me doing a new episode every week, it does seem a bit like a lifetime ago since I last covered the great Gianna sisters. Now, I spent absolutely ages trying to find out what I could for its history and research for the episode. I tend to think that most of us are here for the Amiga stuff, but I know I stopped short of going into what happened in the later years with that company and the game itself. About a week after I'd released the episode, Dudley from Yesterzine, who's also a Patreon, did his own special episode about it over on YouTube. Now that covered a lot more of the history that I'd missed in the later years. I'm not going to spoil the story for you here, so I'll just drop a link into it in the show notes. So if you want to see a decent follow-up to what happened next with loads more info than I could have ever given you anyway, just make sure to check out his channel. For our next news item, Amiga Old Schooler messaged me over on Twitter recently just to mention that a new issue of the Dismag vs. 8 has come out. It's like a strong demo based magazine and from a quick read through there's about 40 different charts, magazine articles if that's the right word for it. It's proper packed with decent Amiga content. There's also several demo tunes to play along through it as well and the good thing is it's all available for free. They've just announced that issue 9 is in the works and there's also a section on the site for voting for the best Amiga demos. Now that really does take me right back to the old days when you'd send stuff off on a postcard waiting for all of the results. Yes, I did live through the 90s, it was a very weird time. It's still going if you want to jump in and place a vote, so I'll place a link for it all in the usual place. It's always important to support stuff like this and I'm always happy to bring this up before you guys, so please spread the word and let people know about it. As we get older and older, I suppose a lot of this stuff is just going to start disappearing, so we need to offer what support we can. Moving on to our last bit of news this week, I'm always on the lookout for new and exciting game releases, especially for you lot and, well, myself. You know, I am a big Amiga gamer. Now, no matter how many games I play or cover for the show, I've always got an eager eye out to try something new. I think the Amiga public domain scene isn't really a thing anymore, but there's still a big crowd doing much smaller releases, and I know when I saw Landfill over on the English Amiga boards, I just had to mention it on the show. This comes to us courtesy of Klebin over on the forum itself. Now this is basically a clone of Columns with some rather depressing backgrounds on plastic filled beaches and parks and as you play through the game you do clean them up a bit. They all change the more piles of junk that builds up and you have to match two or more items I think to make them all disappear. The difference here is you can swap two of them around after they land so you can quickly make up some mega chains and combos and clear out each area. Now it's only a small game but from the quick go I had on it I thought it could be very, very addictive and it really was a lot of fun. I'll post a link to the forum thread with all of the downloads available, but if you have a few minutes spare, honestly, I'd highly recommend that you go and give this one a go. Well, that's all about the news we have time for this week. I'm always on the lookout for more, so if you hear of anything interesting you might want to share with me or just want other people to know about, then by all means, please drop me a line over on Twitter. Now, the account for that is at AmigaRamaPod. For now, let's go and save some cool spots on the beach.
what better way to break past 100 episodes than looking back at what is, in my mind, one of the best mascots to ever come out of the 1990s. He's got that cool, radical, kickback appearance that just makes him stand out a mile. I have played all of the Cool Spot games before, but that was over on the Sega Mega Drive, and if I ever saw this on the Amiga, I doubt it would have been much more than, say, a magazine cover disc. I have lots of fond memories of this on the Mega Drive, so it's going to be good to go back and see if it's held up today, all these years later, on the Amiga. The more shows we do, the more I'm starting to think that there's just an endless supply of these character mascots. They're just everywhere and in absolutely everything. And Cool Spot to me is probably one of the biggest. Now this was published and developed by Virgin in-house. They also did all the sensible soccer games, Grimblood, Heimdall, Silkworm, loads and loads of different titles. In fact, I think the Amiga years and the Mega Drive years were some of their biggest. Now this came out in 1993 on just three floppy disks. It was a single player game and priced at £29.99. The coder behind it was John Twiddy. He did Aladdin before this, Global Gladiators, sorry actually Aladdin came out after didn't it? Putty Squad was also another that he did, I have loads of research notes on that, I'm really eager to do an episode. God knows when we're going to get round to it, as always it's on the list. Graphics wise, it was done by Teoman Ermac, that's a great name to say, also on Aladdin, Heroes of the Lance, First and Second Samurai, I think that's the platformer with the spinning sword, that reminds me of Kid Chaos. Anyway, music wise, Andrew Barnabas, he doesn't seem to have many games behind him, Aladdin, Global Gladiators, Double Dragon Free, and Swiv, so not bad ones at all I'd say there. Cool Spot isn't the first time the 7up mascot made his appearance on the Amiga. A few years prior to this platformer, he appeared in a puzzle board game called Spot, with the character popping up to perform lots of different animations during big moves. Now that was a quick and easy game for Virgin to make, and it appeared on lots of different systems, but soon disappeared into obscurity. I mean, I'm not even sure if there's enough there to do a full show on, so at the very least I'm mentioning it here so we know about it. It's basically something like your public domain type game. It was a very, very simple board game, a bit like tic-tac-toe, that sort of stuff. Going back to Cool Spot, Will Anderson had just been working on a new RPG, which he'd sent off in the hope of getting Virgin's approval, when one day out of the blue, they brought him inside to discuss a Cool Spot game for 7up. Virgin already had an idea in place for a typical platformer by this point, and it was thanks to the large amount of documented paperwork that Will had done on his RPG that they decided to bring him in-house to use his services. The fact he put so much time and effort into it had really impressed the company, thinking in turn he wouldn't have much problem putting the same ideas into yet another game. This is probably the most standout thing to me, it's a very strange thing for him to do. I mean, you're getting someone who's done an RPG to do a platformer. It's a bit like making a baseball player go and join a badminton team then expecting amazing results. To me, the two just don't mix, but a fool and his money, I suppose. Virgin had the money to invest, so if they thought it was right, I'm sure we'll uh, find out what happened next. At first, the assigned programmer had to be removed from the Cool Spot project. After it was discovered, he'd used all of the Sega Mega Drive's cartridge memory, spending all of the time coming up with just the animated title screen. He'd spent months doing that, and it looked absolutely amazing with Cool Spot surfing on from the side of the screen on top of this bottle, but it was a complete disaster for the game's development. This was when Dave Perry was brought in to try and fix all the coding. Think Earthworm Jim and Shiny Entertainment in later years. Whilst this was all going on, arguments between 7up and Cool Spot's marketing company broke out between all of the teams. No one was actually sure what it was meant to be, or really what they should be driving it towards. This really is everything to do with a troubled development. 
both the marketing company and 7up owned a share in the character and neither side could agree what to do with him and before long virgin pulled the developers away to work on global gladiators by the time this was all done and dusted they managed to sort out the differences and work could begin on turning this into a platformer again none of this was wasted time though as will anderson was able to learn a lot from the mcdonald's game global gladiators and that in turn helped him to work on cool spots design with a lot clear revision of what he actually wanted to do with it there wasn't much of a character to use for cool spot beyond his well red spot look and it was thanks to the adverts and his cool movements that they decided to focus on that element the more I read about it, it sounded more and more like they just had a very short marketing brief and they had to come up with a deeper concept themselves, making up for it by trying to create the best platform game that they could. Partway through, they realised that 7up wasn't as big a deal in the European market and if they wanted the game and the character to sell well, they'd have to focus a lot more on, well, Spot himself than the actual brand of the pop. This meant that a lot of the branding for the drink was removed in game and little was done to show off what the company had originally asked for. As luck would have it though, Cool Spot had just enough recognition to push past his soft drink beginnings and it was much easier to build the focus of the game around him outside of the US. Virgin never really limited what the designers could do and they had plenty of opportunities to add all sorts of things to the game to at least try and put it up against the likes of Sonic and Mario. You could even argue that its animations led to Disney taking note of the company, leading them on to do much bigger and much better things. Thanks to Cool Spot's success, 7up bestowed all sorts of recognition on Virgin, flooding their offices with toy mascots, cups, mugs, caps, practically every piece of Cool Spot memorabilia you could even imagine. It was a bit of a bonus for the company because all of the gaming press really, really liked the game, so their logo was plastered on every magazine practically available for free. Something that would have cost them an arm and a leg in a marketing budget if they had to fund it themselves. It does make me think that if you are a big company like this, maybe you should take note of stuff like this. If you can come up with a big, exciting game that can spread by word of mouth, it's not just some licensed trash, then it will do the work itself. The word will get out there and it will sell like hotcakes. I think Cool Spot across all formats sold, well, millions. It brought so much brand recognition to 7up it was a massive massive success bringing us over to the ports then this came out on the game boy super nintendo pc sega game gear master system and sega mega drive spawning all sorts of sequels on the other systems yet this finished at number one on the amiga most games do have stories when I cover them, but oh, for this one, I'm really sorry. I, I had to read this one out, so I do apologize. For years, Wild Wicked Wily Will has been trying to capture a real life spot to prove to the world that they really do exist. Today, they have never been spotted. Now, Will may be about to get his wish. In a moment of true wickedness, he plays cunning spot trap cages in all of the fun places where other spot friends would be hanging out. The traps have worked all too well. There is now a spot caught in every single cage and Will will be back in any minute to take spots into captivity forever. Good news everyone. Thankfully, Cool Spot's here to save the day. When I first loaded the game, I knew we were in for something really special when the Virgin logo appeared from the left of the screen and Cool Spot was pushing it off from the side and then paused to give his shades a clean. It did put me in mind of Aladdin's opening animation, getting the same sort of treatment. It's not much I'll admit, but it did make me chuckle a little before I'd even fired up the game. This is a platformer after all, so pressing fire on the main screen does send you straight into the action on the first level. The first thing you will see on the top is a silver bar showing off a picture of Spot with a weird shot look to his face. 
This is next to a number of lives and being hit by anything on screen will peel off a little bit of Spot's look right up until you lose a life. Alongside that is a big red score indicator and a cool counter for the number of spots collected, not forgetting the time limit which is shoved in there too. The aim of the game is quite simple, you're tasked with collecting a number of spots on every level before moving over to the next one. If you reach the exit before you find them all, it just won't let you pass and the spot remains in its cage. This is as simple as it gets and it effectively makes you wander around randomly exploring all of the stages. With 100 to collect, you are forced to see rather more than you might expect and there's a choice of 3 difficulty levels if you find any of it too tough. The higher it is set to, the more cool points you have to find in order to free your spotty friend locked in a cage. I wouldn't be expecting anything fancy with these friends in the cages. They're all just spot sprites with shades on. They didn't seem to want to waste any of that art budget to come up with something decent. Spot as a character is taken straight from the side of a can of 7up. Yes, there is one in here, but you don't get to glue yourself to it and he's sized to about the size of what you would expect. Big, brash, bright red and colourful with a 90s aesthetic that really stands out a mile. Controlling Spot is as simple as it gets. Fire will fling spots in the direction you're facing and pressing up will make him jump. It does go a step further and let you use a second joystick button if you want to. Thankfully, there's no messing around within the options, it all just works, at least it did for me when I tried it on emulation and my standard Amiga. That lack of a second button is always one of my major gripes with games, and if there's any programmers listening, I'd love to know why so many games just didn't do it back then, or at least try to make it standard. We've had a few coders pop up for previous shows, so if you are listening, please let us know because it can't have been that big of a deal to include. With his large sprite, Spot has a floaty feeling when he moves about the screen. Not enough to annoy, but moving around like he's just out for a stroll, instead of doing, well, anything urgent. I kept half expecting him to pull a fonz and stick his thumbs out all the time. The levels are set in real world locations, so you get the chance to pay a visit to the beach, a dock ship, a bonus stage that's set in a bath, and even a toy train in a children's room. They are tropes today for sure, but back then those were quite refreshing to visit. Graphics were improving all the time, and seeing all these different colours with a dash of realism really does add a lot to the gameplay in the places that you actually get to see. This sort of level setup always makes me want to dig out my Dreamcast and play some Toy Commander again. I guess I'm quite the sap for real world locations in stuff and this really does do it well. For some reason there's no bosses to be seen and the closest threat you come across on any of the stages are well just the enemies. They always seem to match the theme of the level, from shell crabs to mice in pyjamas, that was an odd one, and even kamikaze planes. It might not give much challenge in the boss department, but it more than makes up for that with all the weird variety of enemy designs. Firing a few shots at any enemy has a small chance of them turning into a 7-up glass. That in turn can refill your health and it does seem to happen at random so it's really in your best interest to take out as many of them as you can. With all of the enemies being in set places, the challenge comes from leaping around from platform to platform, bouncing off bubbles and scrambling over ropes and balloons. Most of what you can see on screen can be traversed and plenty needs a good run up to make it safely across. The levels really do show that it's a platformer at its core. But don't be expecting anything in the lines of say Super Mario World or even Sonic. Cool Spot's strongest feature has to be the animation. Leaving him standing for just a few seconds and he will start to play through several different ones at once. Cleaning his glasses, playing with a yo-yo, yawning and snapping his fingers to the beat of the music that's going on in the background. There's loads in here and it does give him a lot more depth than you would ever expect, well, just a red spot to have. 
famous last words, but I think this was becoming more common in the early 90s as older 8-bit games just couldn't do any of these animations or the graphics and the fancy stuff and it's fun to see what they were able to come up with. I will say that Spot is one of the better mascot characters that I've seen. He even falls in a funny, sprawled out way. As you lot know, I didn't get on with The Lion King, but these two games do go hand in hand with that awesome animation style. Cool Spot was Virgin just starting to dip their toes in the water for this type of stuff, and it really does show with this game. When it comes to the music and sound effects for most Amiga games, the one thing that truly makes them special is having them all on at the same time. You do get the mix here, and every stage has cool, funky beats that stand out a mile, and if they do start to grate, there's always the easy option to let you flick them off. Oh, I've just realised what I said there. Anyway, moving swiftly on, with that out of the way, let's go and have a look at some of CoolSpot's problems. I was really confused by CoolSpot's awful jerky scrolling. For most of the time, he moves at a snail's pace, and then, quite at random, once running along, he really can pick up a fair bit of speed. It just doesn't play right. It's slow, ponderous, with spurts of speed at random. It's very unbalanced and not something the Mega Drive version suffers from at all, so there's no excuse for it here. I'm really not sure what happened. Another thing I really have to bring up is the top bar. It just takes up way too much space on screen. It's like it's trying to muscle into the screen space where it just doesn't belong. And when you want to see what's going on around you, especially in a game where it forces you to explore, it just gets in the way. Slimming it down would have helped massively and I really couldn't understand why they decided to do this. The viewpoint on the main screen is a bit strange to say the least. The levels can be quite large with obstacles that are way bigger than spot, yet they decided to zoom the view in so close that you never get a real sense of being able to enjoy a level properly. You always want to have a good look around and you are meant to explore the levels but this is just way too limiting with what you can see. I don't know what was going on. Open it up a bit more. Give us more space to play in and actually see. I mean that would have made me happy to say the least. Let's have a look at the magazine scores and see what they came up with. Amiga Power gave it 85%, that's quite high. Amiga Action, 82. See You Amiga, which is the lowest, at 61%. And finally, Amiga Computing at 86%. Not bad scores at all, I don't think I'd place it that highly myself. Anything that involves big companies and pay promotions, I'm always going to be highly suspicious of, and those scores do make me think something funny was going on, because they are a wee bit too high. There's no way with its slow scrolling that this is any more than, say, a 70 percenter. See You Amiga is just about right on the nose, but you can probably guess where I'm going with this. There's far too many problems to have this as a high ranker, and the biggest one with that has to be the display. The viewpoint is way too silly and restrictive. If you're going to force a game where you need to comb over every inch of the screen, then reveal tiny sections of it, and not let the player see it all, then something's seriously wrong with your game. The sad thing is, the artwork is really well drawn, and I did want to see more and more of it. But this is a common complaint across all of the ports that came out, so it's not just the Amiga one that suffered here. Putting this up against the Mega Drive, just to see how different the two were, and it's obvious the slow scrolling and speed just isn't up to par. Yet the Amiga has the vast improvement of a moving background, and I do wonder if they could have maybe dropped that out to make the rest of the game run better. The jerkiness is a bit like running and jumping through treacle. It's doable and you can ignore it, but it can become annoying. There's a few points where you can run really quickly down a hill with good scrolling, so the game is capable of doing this, yet it just never seems capable of doing it. Spot moves well enough with a joystick that I couldn't really fault the controls at all, but it just leaves you with the taste of yet another inferior Mega Drive console port. You know, they really should have done better. 
Coming out in 1993, Commodore weren't exactly falling to pieces yet and the market was easily big enough to support good Amiga ports. They just haven't done enough here. The core mechanics all work and once I got used to the scrolling it did offer some entertainment, if a little brief. The music and the effects work great with the animations and there's a good game to see in here beneath it all. The levels are all based in the real world and they do offer enough variety to keep you at least on your toes and exploring. I'm starting to worry that I'm turning into the Mega Drive show as there's yet another one here I'm going to recommend you go and play over there. This isn't on the same level of say Pugsy by any means and I'm probably kinda towards it because well Cool Spot is cool. He's got all that 90s attitude and personality about him and I just can't be too harsh on the little guy. I really do think they should bring the guy back, he's awesome. The worst part is the marketing campaigns worked, it well and truly got me because I really really want a kind of 7 up. It might be a ropey plodding game but it's a bit of genuine marketing genius and you need to celebrate those things as much as you can. Take a breather, it's about time to bring the show to a close. You can of course get in touch with me on facebook.com slash AmigaRama, drop me a line on Twitter which is at AmigaRamaPod or even use snail mail which is lefarious at AmigaRama.com. I do respond to all messages and if anyone has any points they want to bring up or possibly something for me to mention on the show, by all means drop me a line. Before that final bell tolls though, we do have to send out a massive thank you to all of our Patreon supporters. If you would like to offer some support for the show or generally just see what's going on over there, you can pop on to patreon.com slash AmigaRama and offer some support. This week's Patreons are 10 Minute Amiga Retrocast, Adam Bradley, Darren Coles, Dudley from Yesterzine, Gary Heather, Graham Vebke, Glenn Milford from Casual Retro Gamer Weekly, Jason Warns, Jan Holbo Rasmussen, Laurent Giraud, O'Brien's Retro and Vintage, Pistol, Quentin Barnes, Richard Legg, Richard Pearson, Steve Engeldow, and finally, Treble. Thanks for listening, and until next time, guys. 